Hello everyone, welcome to the Kevin Lee Social. Thank you for tuning in. What initially began as an eight-part series interviewing entrepreneurs to share and inspire how they've successfully pivoted during COVID-19, I have decided not only to continue this series, but also to expand on the scope to understand and learn about people's craft, philosophy, the challenges they face in the industry, and their favorite failures that have helped shape them to become who they are today. By going deeper and understanding different thought leaders, businesses, and industries, the idea is to help cross-pollinate ideas applicable in your life and inspire action in this new norm we live in. I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Today, we have Will Fung. Will had studied architecture at the University of New South Wales. Upon graduation, Will travelled to the Netherlands where he joined Will Arendt's Architects in 99 and worked on a diverse range of projects, including houses, apartment towers, stadiums, urban master plans, and warehouse facilities. Returning to Sydney, Will was project architect at England Mall, working on a number of retail, commercial, and residential projects. Will has been a guest critic at the Schools of Architecture at the University of New South Wales and University of Technology Sydney, and a sessional design tutor at the University of Sydney. He was jury chair for single residential projects at the New South Wales Chapter AIA Awards in 2017 and a co-jury member for the 2013 Australian Interior Design Awards. Will co-founded CoAP with Charles Michael in 2005. Everyone, please help me welcome Will. Hi Will, thank you for Hi. coming on to the show. How Hi are you? Kev, <laughs> I'm good thanks, thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. I've been wanting to do this podcast for a very long time with you. I uh, had to work up the courage to ask you and then finally tee up a good time with you as well. Uh, no, it's great. Welcome. I wanted to start off with your company, CoApp. Is it a multi-generational practice? And if so, could you share it with us? Where did it all begin? Yes, I guess the story kind of starts almost 20 years ago. Not that we've been around for 20 years, but when I was a student, I uh, started working with Tina England and Ian Moore, England Moore Architects, and that was mid-90s, 96, 97. And I started uh, doing almost like an internship there for a while whilst I was still studying. And then when I finished studying, I went overseas for a bit and came back and kept, went back to England more, the, the practice, till about early 2000s. And then I left that and started, started co-op. And then about a year or two later, Tina from England Moore left that company as well and joined our practice. And so it is multi-generational in the sense that she was my mentor at the time when I was working at England Moore. And then in terms of generations, she's you know, 10 years ahead of me in terms of experience and everything. So it was interesting. The first few years was interesting adjusting to that kind of world. She was my boss and now we're equal and there was... The issues were only at my end where I felt like I couldn't be an equal with her. The things that we did together, I felt not unworthy, but I, yeah, just felt like I was always maybe below. But then things started building and yeah, things are absolutely fine now. But the beginning was interesting. It was interesting adapting to that point of view. Yeah. yeah. It went full circle. It started off with her and then you got out. Yeah. Came back and then joined as partners. Yeah, yeah. She was always the fun one at um, England Moore. And we yeah. always clicked and yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine, that, as you mentioned, that the dynamics would have been interesting from the beginning. Uh, mm, yeah, yeah. We always knew how we, how we worked. We're very different the way that we work. Yeah. But that's complementary. Mm. Yeah. And just to, a quick dive in from that, it's the... Uh, England. Did you guys also design the building, the Republic building that we're, we're in? No, no. That that building is designed by a firm called Burley Caton Halliday. Okay. And she used to work for Burley Caton Halliday. Okay. So that's where maybe that aesthetic comes from as well. Yeah, it's a very minimalist, white, early 90s, yeah, kind of thing. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with the backstory. <laughs> And I've met Tim, she is such a lovely lady. So you both have really lovely energy. And when you guys come by, it's always a joy. <laughs> yeah, we always love chatting with you. No, it's great. Yeah. It's nice that you're just up the road. Yeah. And you, you mentioned you, you traveled um, to the Netherlands. 
and mm. you, for work. Um, and I've researched that you've worked at the architecture office, Wheel Arts. Mm. And could you share with us, how do you think that's influenced or shaped your practice? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think working in the Netherlands was, I guess it was my first proper job because it was the first proper job I got after I left university. I went over for a working holiday visa and I ended up staying for a couple of years. Um, the way that they structure things is very studio-based. It almost felt like I was still at university in a strange way. They have teams, in, at least in that office, there was a design team and a documentation team. And you were either a design architect or a documentation architect, so quite technical or quite creative. And I ended up being on the creative team, mainly probably due to the fact that I was a fresh graduate and had not much experience with the technical aspects of architecture. But that actually was really great because I got a lot of responsibility in a very short amount of time. A lot of the scene, uh, a few of the senior staff members left when I had arrived. So I got thrown into the deep end on, on quite a few projects. And I thought, and I think that was a really great start potentially to a career. I didn't get paid very much. Living almost in poverty in the Netherlands isn't great, especially when the produce is really expensive, food's really awful, and yeah, <laughs> um, I only lasted a couple of years, so I came home. But the experience was amazing, like really, really good. And I think it probably set a basis of how maybe I thought that our studio could work in a way. Not that, not that, that we're... Um, splitting office up into designers and tech technicians, but just the fact that people can have a lot of responsibility at quite a young age. I think that's quite a nice thing to do, being thrown in the deep end and things and having to learn very quickly is really good, as I did also at England Mall when I came back from the Netherlands, when I came back to Sydney, also got thrown in the deep end on a few projects where you had to make lots of mistakes and learn very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And I could imagine as well, I think with any discipline, when you're overseas and you're, you're learning, everyone kind of approaches it slightly differently mm. in any discipline. And I, I can imagine, would it be the same in, in yours as well? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. how they do it in Europe versus in Australia versus in, uh, in Asia versus. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. But yeah, Holland was great. <laughs> <laughs> I did a bit of research as well and found out, is, is it right that your parents are from Hong Kong? Mm, right. yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you, you arrived when you were two, maybe? <laughs> yeah, uh, four, four or four, five. Four or five, five, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, did they have a Chinese restaurant as well? Yeah, yeah, they were like fully, I grew up sort of being within either a takeaway shop or a Chinese restaurant or some kind of food service or hospitality environment. They were very hard working, working 18, 20 hours <laughs> in a day because that's what you do when you're in hospitality. Yep. Um, and yeah, just, yeah, it's like a very different, neither of, you know, my parents, as with, I think, a lot of immigrants, um, they have different qualifications when they, you know, they, when they were in Hong Kong, and when they moved here, their qualifications went up to scratch, so then they had to find something else to do. Yeah. Um, you know, my mum was a nurse, and my dad was an optical dispenser, yeah. and English wasn't great, and so my uncle, who was already here, helped them set up, set things up. They purchased a business, and then off they went. Mm. Yeah. And. Uh, with your heritage being from Hong Kong and your upbringing in, in hospitality as well, mm. how do you think that's influenced your outlook on work? Yeah, just being quite hard working, I think, but not, there's always a balance of pleasure and work. But yeah, I think growing up in that environment, we didn't have many holidays. <laughs> and <laughs> at all like there were never family trips in summer or anything like that it was just always working so i don't feel like i missed out on anything but maybe that i don't take very many holidays myself and maybe that's ingrained in me a little bit i don't feel like i need to <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 i don't know yeah yeah, I can resonate. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the Asian families don't take holidays. They just work through everything. <laughs> no, they just work through everything. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> that take off is for Chinese New Year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the only holiday, really. <laughs> what Christmas? What New Year? We just wake up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> when everyone takes off, it's time to make money. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> um, and obviously, Coop has many accolades and you're very well respected in the community. I've spoken to colleagues in the industry, people that know you and everyone really looks up to you and respects you and they all think you're an amazing human being, which I think so as well. I agree. That's crazy. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've seen that with a, with a business of your kind of caliber, um, co-app I've still likes to remain a small to medium sized office. Mm. Can you share with us more on why that is the case? Yeah, we just don't want to be too stressed out <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> we don't, we like doing big projects and then, and if we do, we try to raft or collaborate with a bigger office to do those bigger projects. But we don't really want to burden ourselves to being a big office. Plus, we, at the end of the day, our staff or our family, it's quite intimate. Um, we want to know everyone. We want to, not that we're control freaks, we like to know what everyone's doing. We like to know what's going on. And for us, the sweet spot is eight, eight people in the office for Tina and I. That's really good in size. And we're, we're still able to do projects that we like and a very broad range of typology, of types of projects. So yeah, keeping small for us, keeping nimble as well. We went through the, the GFC relatively unscathed because we were small, like we were three or four at the time. <clears throat> we were able to weather through that without calamity. And I think if we were a bigger office, it would have been much more difficult. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of beauty in working with constraints uh, and with a smaller team. Mm. Uh, even if the projects become bigger or whatever the case, it just means you have to be more creative or yeah. have to think outside of how we're going to approach this. Similarly to my, my space is just quite small. Mm. <laughs> and it's uh, okay, uh, how do we um, scale up but without space, with the limit of how many people we can fit there? Yeah. There's only so much I can do. There's only so much people I can fit. Yeah. And then we have to get really creative from there. How yeah. Expand. Yeah, and that sort of, you know, trickles down to our projects as well where we actually like really complicated and not that we go out looking for them, but a lot of our projects end up or are, are very constrained either with budget or site or, or whatever it is, but that always, yeah, fuels your creativity to resolve and um, resolve the issues and resolve the problems and then you get much more creative solutions for things yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. and i think this ties in really nicely to the next question because during this re recording as you mentioned you were talking about the challenges of gfc during this recording we're still going through the COVID 19 period mm. um and architecture is a very hands-on type of craft whether you're modeling or dealing with materials textures or even meeting with clients how are you managing your projects at the moment or dealing with the constraints of COVID? Yeah, we're lucky in that at the end of last year, probably around October, November, or even before then, we transferred all of our servers and things to the cloud, not knowing that this was going to happen, obviously, but we had, everyone had access to the server remotely. So that really helped when everyone had to work from home. And then forcing us to go online and have Zoom meetings and meet clients via Zoom and especially um, via these sort of interfaces has um, been actually very good. We've all got iPads now. We all mark up and take notes and things. Just thought that was a lot more efficient and everyone loves it. It's working really well. So it's in that sense, it's been really good for us to it's almost made us evolve quicker than we would have the COVID situation because I think we were probably a little bit reluctant to we're still printing drawings and we were still marking up hard copies of drawings and wasting lots of paper but now we're hardly ever using the printer yeah you know, we're just marking up things on pdf and we probably should have done that years ago but because of this it's forced us to 
do it now. So that's, that's been quite good. And, and then also the other thing was that we didn't have any projects that were currently under construction. I know a lot of other practices have had issues and struggled with that, going to site and having restrictions um, on site. But yeah, coincidentally, we haven't had anything getting built during this time. Yeah. Um, lots of things are still in design development or going to DA. So, yeah. That's, uh, I'm really ha happy to hear that you guys haven't been too affected by the current uh, pandemic and that you guys are able to improve your <laughs> efficiency in your systems mm. and, and take that on and adopt it very well. It, yeah, it's, it's been quite a challenge for a lot of businesses out there. So it's yeah. great that you guys are doing well in that sense. Yeah, we're not necessarily getting more jobs, but we're, from what we've got, we've, we're doing things, I think, more efficiently. Yeah. Potentially. And I'm curious to see what's your opinion on how it will continue to affect the industry moving forward. How do you think it will shake things up or change things? There's a lot of talk about, in terms of building typology, how commercial buildings are now getting more and more empty because a lot of businesses are realising that lots of people can just work from home. <laughs> Mm. Um, and they may never even have to come back to the office or what does the office actually mean these days or will mean. Things like co-sharing workspaces and hot des desking might all disappear now because of germs. Going back to having everyone having their dedicated desks and things like that, there's big talk about that. Mm. Yeah, industry is always the first to get hit during any kind of financial downturn and big multi-res projects and things like that you can sense that they've all slowed down obviously but your mums and dads who are wanting to do renovations i've heard in you know a lot there's a lot more happening at the moment <laughs> because everyone's staying at home <clears throat> and everyone wants to improve their homes because they are staying at home yeah yeah i've, I've, I've been hearing a lot more about that as well where uh, uh, people instead of obviously they can't travel at the moment and they can't mm. really spend in that category and mm. so instead they're making the, their home environments more a better place to stay in. so yeah. they're investing in that yeah yeah but i don't know what percentage or what demographic that is compared to everyone else yeah yeah it's also the, a luxury as well that, mm. that end and do you prefer to work from home is no, it, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Like to separate the home and work life. Yeah, definitely. Even when I did have to work from home for those few months, I was my partner was uh, working in the dining room. Mm -hmm. Was quite happy to do so. He had a big setup of monitors and things, but then I had to be in a separate room that didn't feel like home. So I was in the front room and room that I never usually go into. So I needed that. Yeah, needed yeah. to be separated. Yeah. yeah. I, I I understand. I think it's important to to have that separation or that boundary. And it gets well, it gets me personally into that more mm. focused work zone rather than yeah. So easy to just fall back into something else. Yeah, and also just for simple. I told everyone in the office that if you're working from home, make sure you start work in work clothes. <laughs> yes. Simple things like that. Have a shower. Get dressed go to work even if it's going to be a meter away from your bed like yeah. you know don't start working pajamas or yeah you, yeah <laughs> Talk, talking about clothes I, I think it's a good segue you're obviously a very fashionable man i've heard you're into uh i'm not sure if this is the correct term but high fashion uh, <laughs> it do you use that in relation to your work at all in terms of how you think of things I tell you that, obviously, love design, fashion, and clothes. I follow designers. I'm always very interested, as I do with you know, graphic designers and um, furniture designers, just any designer. I, I just love filtering and getting influenced by different disciplines. And quite often, Tina and I would see something like a colorway or something that the designer have done and that would influence us in the way that we might approach a project or a texture or the way that something's made it's always really yeah it's always really stimulating looking at other things i think we might 
look at other disciplines sometimes more than other architects work mm. quite often we're, we're drawing um, drawing influences from other aspects of design and yeah yeah clothing is yeah one of them like i'm really into vintage stuff at the moment um looking back at old things from the 80s and 90s that i could never afford but then finding them second hand yeah. and you know it's been really nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I agree i think it's a great to look at different industries whether it's design or um, in fashion or wherever it may be for that cross-pollination of ideas mm. it's always interesting to see how they came up with it or what was the thought process behind it or yeah materials or how did it yeah what came up what was the ethos and then you draw influences as you said into you into your own work i think yeah, yeah. that's where the innovation creativity starts yeah <laughs> As I mentioned before, I've observed that your team really respect and look up to you. And as you've got this really, every time you guys walk in, it's got this family vibe and you rock in together and then everyone orders together and everyone stands around together. And every week it's that, in the, in the beginning of the week, it's that, oh, how was your weekend and, and everything. Yeah. And I'm, I'm always fascinated in ways that uh, leaders lead and how they manage their teams. Um, do you have a team management philosophy or is there a, a way that you take it? Totally not. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, it's interesting that you observed that. We all, yeah, we think we're a happy team, I think. But I think it's just, I don't know, it's a hard question to answer. Maybe it's just the way Tina and I are, just generally. She's quite fun and bubbly and I guess I'm a bit more calm and reserved, but that we give everyone a sense of ownership for what they do in the office. We try not to be too tyrannical about things. And, yeah, we, we do, look, for us, it's really important that we all get on and that we feel like family. Mm. Um, yeah. But there's no, yeah, we don't have a philosophy or an approach to doing it consciously. <laughs> So you mentioned you give them that responsibility, you're not over their shoulders too much about certain projects. Are there, do, do you guys do team bonding activities often or anything? No, no <laughs> not, not at all. I'm completely not into that type of thing. <laughs> um, no. Okay, there are things that maybe we don't, that we do that um, aren't necessarily um, in that realm. So let's say we try to all go out for lunch at least once a week, yeah. you know, office lunch and we'd go somewhere. And so things like that we try to do yeah. so that everyone is still engaged and everyone doesn't just feel like work. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, another funny comment that came up is when I asked around about you, who was one of the calmest people I've ever known? He yeah. never gets upset. And no, not that I am as calm as you, but I've been, people showed me I have a calm energy as well. Mm. but you, you, you're probably the calmest person, one of the calmest people I've ever come, come across from another calm guy to another calm guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really calm. Do I have a pulse? I don't know. Like. <laughs> um, I personally meditate and I have a few other practices. As, but mm, yeah. do, do you have any practices that help you or is it more of an innate thing? For me, it's probably more innate. I might not show any stress, but sometimes I'm like all curdled up inside but it's not showing necessarily. And yep. um, also I'm a Scorpio. I can be very calm, but then I can strike. Yeah. If, if I have been known to occasionally to strike. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> my, my sister's a Scorpio. I, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it takes a lot for me to get to that threshold, I think. Yeah. 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 I think as a leader as well, you, it's, I think it's a great quality to have that you're very calm, but then you strike when needed as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you talk about meditation and things. When I was at high school, there was a, um, and I don't know if this has helped me the way, to be the way I am, but there was a strange elective course at high school that I went to called Eastern Philosophy. Mm -hmm. And all we did was just meditate wow. for an hour in this <laughs> class. And this is when I was in year seven or eight or something. 
that's a long time <laughs> yeah yeah no, it was really good and maybe that's helped me a bit but maybe not i'm not sure <laughs> but there is yeah and i have tried doing that sort of mindfulness thing and having an app but i'm way too um, impatient yeah yeah uh, so to keep us uh year seven student uh, meditating for an hour is is, uh-huh. is a very strong feat. I think <laughs> if yeah. it's really into you, it's it's done a good job. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was really good. Lots of people wanted to get into that class, obviously, because all you did was just fall asleep, effectively. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do nothing class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it was great. I hear you are a big fan of modernist architecture. Uh, mm. Could you share with the audience what that means and what is it about modernist architecture that excites you? I think it's always been modernism. (laughs) There's always been just that moment. And I guess there's different ways of defining modernism, but for me it's that moment when new technologies and new ways of building liberated us from the past. So from the neoclassical, we all of a sudden built things on you know, slender columns and had big windows and concrete and all those sorts of things. And it's always been that idea of the future and the new. So I think that's, for me, that's really interesting and really exciting. And even now, it's the first bits of what we call modernism maybe happened in the early 1900s or even late 1800s. But even now, when you look back at those buildings, they're still incredibly contemporary and incredibly modern. And that kind of just um, illustrates how influential and what a big leap forward that was. Um, saying that I'm, when I travel, or used to travel, <laughs> going to Italy or wherever and seeing antiquity and seeing old, classical, renaissance, whatever it might be, those old things, like they've becoming, they're becoming more uplifting as well for me, just seeing the, we don't build that way anymore. We don't have that craftsmanship anymore which is, I think, what modernism may be obliterated. It's getting that slowly you see some projects where that sort of idea of craft and idea of detail is coming back, but without being pastiche, still doing it in a way that's contemporary. So, yeah, I think that's what modernism excites me. It's just the, yeah, the notion of a big leap forward and doing things in a new way. And that sort of, and it was a whole movement, not just architecture, obviously, art, the way we think, industry. Is, is there any, are there any uh, examples or, of places or galleries that you would recommend? In terms of a building or just a place to hang out? But maybe a building that represents it. Yeah, I've always, I mean, something local, actually. It's something I always love, and I bang on about this quite a bit, the National Art Gallery in Canberra. Yep. Big concrete brutalist building built, yeah, it was built in the late 70s, early 80s by Colin Madigan. And, uh, yeah, really epic building. Not necessarily a new type of building for its time, but just the way that it integrates to the landscape. There's a lot of native um, landscape around it that, works really beautifully with the brutalism the spaces like when you go into those old not old but those sort of concrete buildings there's a smell to them that Mm. is amazing like this sort of musty concretey earthy smell that i love when i go into yeah those types of buildings but yeah that's i love that building and just the spaces it's not even there for the artwork it's the, the spaces the ramps the context yeah, it's a really great building. Yeah. I, I, every time you go there, it has that this is sense of feeling that you get when you arrive and you walk in and everything just, you feel like you can almost shift in time. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's, it's fantastic. And anyone that comes across Coap can see it's been shortlisted and taken many awards. Um, mm. I'm sure it hasn't always been this way. Um, mm. Do you have a favourite failure that has set you up for later success? Many failures. <laughs> Maybe not epic, but <laughs> more disappointments or realising that we did things a certain way that wasn't great. One example is that we were f- fired from a project and it was, we thought it was going quite well and it was mainly just a furniture specification project and 
doing interiors for a, for a house that was getting built, not our design, the house was brought in as the interior designers. And I think our went into it thinking that we would be quite loose about it and just the clients had quite an, what we thought, quite an eclectic taste in things so we played up on that and were quite flexible and moved with what the clients wanted but at the end of the day I don't think that's what they wanted at all they just wanted what they wanted us to tell them what they wanted if that makes sense yep. we didn't understand that at all I thought we were being nice and listening to them and so yeah in some way they fired us because we, we gave them what they want which just sounds really weird, but it made us approach and just think about and analyze clients a lot more and just step back and think about each project more analytically, I think, and maybe also being a bit stronger in our assertiveness to be more, being more assertive with clients in order to get things. I think they respect you when you're... A little bit. Yep. I think, yeah, for some reason, I think clients maybe respect you a little bit more when you do tell them when things are wrong, yeah, rather than just playing along with it. Mm -hmm. It's like the bouncer at outside a nightclub not letting you into the nightclub. Yep. That type of thing, you, you want to get in even more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> I can imagine it's a, a very challenging position that you guys are normally put in because, not speaking for everyone, but not everyone knows exactly what they want. No. Um, everyone's very clear on what they want. And if they did, it'd make your job a, lot, a whole lot easier. Yeah, or worse, because then we'd, or we'd just be drafted. Like, we'd just be drafting everybody's ideas yeah. rather than, you know, coming up with the ideas. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that, that process of analysing what they want, or I'm always very curious about that process because... I, I um, enjoy the psychology part of it. And it's the, how do you, for you guys at least, how do you guys even begin to start to analyze to understand what they want on their side? Yeah, it's really hard. Lots of architects do questionnaire sheets at the beginning of projects to flesh out the brief and flesh out what the clients want. We don't tend to do that, probably because we never got around to creating that. <laughs> playing list but always just ask them to give us a brief at the beginning and we come back with them with a counter brief which might add what we think you know our layer of thinking to the to the brief but it's something that's constantly evolving the project might start off one way and then end up in a completely different scope yeah it's really hard there's no right answer to it yeah we've started on another project we've once started started as a you know fifty thousand dollar kitchen renovation and ended up being a two million dollar complete refit of the house wow. just because it just evolved well the kitchens you know they wanted to do the kitchen but then to the kitchen properly you have to do this and then it just grew and grew and then all of a sudden we're stripping out the entire house and rebuilding it so yeah it's sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, like I, you said, the, the clients don't know what they want sometimes at all yeah. unless it's, you start fleshing things out and really getting into what the issues are. Yep. Yeah. And it's also dealing with married couples and, and being an architect, you're almost like a marriage counsellor sometimes. I've experienced some of your work firsthand and working with your team as well on one of the briefs. And I, I was actually thinking about it yesterday mm. and I mm. thought in my head I'm like I where did I keep that file because I, I really want to keep it because I honestly think I'm going to use it mm. in, in another space mm. and I really liked the idea that you guys came back with basing on basing it on the heritage of the how it used to be mm. um, so I have a, a cafe restaurant space in Darlinghurst and for those that don't know and I, I asked Will and his team to, to help brief us on a, 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 a refurb uh, kind of renovation and they came back with this amazing idea basing it off how it used to be a cafe, a cafe back in the 1980s 
<laughs> and I was very fortunate to meet the owners of the of that cafe back in the 1980s, and he sent me all these amazing photos. And then Will, Will and his team put together this uh, amazing signature piece that reflected heritage. I, I, I really, um, honestly, you know, if the complete decision was completely up to me, I'd definitely go back with that design. Yeah. So in, in future projects, I think I would definitely uh, consider yeah. something yeah. along those lines, if not the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was like the idea of lineage and heritage and what came before, not being necessarily nostalgic, but sometimes <clears throat> when you're starting from scratch and you're trying to draw some ideas and context, sometimes yeah, history and heritage is a good way of, to start off with. And if there is something there to draw out, it can blossom into something quite good. Yeah, and especially in a commercial space like the one I'm in, it there's there's a story to it it adds to the branding and there's, mm. there's something that people can yeah can chew on they can just have that idea to chew on and think oh, okay there's, there's a lot more depth to this space than just uh yeah, well, meadery, yeah. yeah how it's evolved now i think is like that as well because it's gone back one step back to what it was and there yeah. is that idea of yeah there's substance to it yeah it's not just it's not just uh a very super it's not just superficial yeah yeah and, and that was another classic example of how a very small build just went back <laughs> yes <laughs> i remember coming with you saying okay i've got a very tight budget wheel <laughs> yes and then let and it's, and then it's like, oh my god you've got some expense tops how do you afford that with that budget <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I went a bit, a bit nuts, but yeah. Anyway, all the time. <laughs> yeah, that looks great. Thank you, thank you. I have a question. Do you have any morning or evening routines? Yeah, totally. Probably more morning than evening. Wake up at six, six thirty, have light breakfast, and then go on a dog walk in Callan Park. We um, live quite close to a park, and yeah, early morning walks are really good. Just helps me reset, start the day. Especially now when it's really cold, I love it. I love going out and I'm just in shorts and a, and a you know, puffer jacket. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's nice getting cold for me. I think it's my Canberra side coming out. Always living in Sydney, I miss those really cold winters. But yeah, so definitely a morning routine. That's every, every day. Yeah. And then on weekends, we, there's organic markets just across the So we always go there in the morning and grab our groceries and yeah. Very mundane, doing the same things over and over again, but I quite like it. I have no complaints. No, I think that's great that you're able to take that walk in the morning to sort of nature and then have reach to fresh market produce and stuff on mm. the weekend. So I think that's a, a really beautiful way. <laughs> to yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm jealous of that lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite movie or books you'd recommend? Oh, they are like really trashy movies <laughs> <laughs> or like quite profound things. <laughs> I might talk about the profound ones because I don't think you really want to know the trashy ones. No, actually, one of my favorite movies is um, uh, Best in Show, which is, which is a parody about show, those big show dog events. Yeah. You know, set in, yeah, this one's set in New York and follows these six couples with their dogs and going to the dog show and yeah it's hilarious the best in show it's a very good movie always love the star wars movies just because they're nostalgic mm. um love them and Gattaca is a really it's another favorite movie of mine as well which is yeah about a not too distant future this was done in the 90s i think Gattaca, late 90s or 2000s ethan hawk jude law uma thurman yeah, yes. Yes, on and it's about it's all about this world where people are born with the right genetics and then everyone so it's not too distant and people get scanned with the genetic genetics and if you're if you have the right combination you get a certain job. And I think and it, it's a beautiful story, but it's also um filmed beautifully in the most amazing buildings. So a beautiful Frank Lloyd Wright building and a beautiful Louis Kahn building in, in America. And yeah, it's really good. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. I'll definitely have to check up a few of them and, and watch it and report back to you. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, 
Are there any new beliefs or behaviors that have had a positive impact in your life in the recent years, you think? New beliefs? No, not really. Um, not particularly religious or follow anything too philosophical. I do believe it's something, but it's, yeah, but I'm not necessarily atheist or anything. Yep. Yeah. But there haven't been anything, no events or anything that have triggered any new way of thinking or a new way of approaching anything. I'm still waiting for that to happen, probably. <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty con at the moment, pretty content. Yeah. How things are. Pending. <laughs> Pending, exactly. Yeah. And as we're coming to the tail end of this conversation, if you could only send one single line of SMS text to yourself five years ago, what would it be? It's a hard one. I know you did send me this previously, like beforehand, and I've been thinking about it. I don't know, Kevin. It's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was stuck on this one for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's a really hard one. I don't think there's anything profound. I think it might be... I think five years ago, I didn't have Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be something like subscribe to Netflix. You'll so just so you just make a list it'll of titles. Open up, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll open up your it'll open up your mind. It'll yeah, and it has been fantastic. <laughs> Actually, quickly on that note, have you been watching anything interesting on Netflix lately? Yeah, probably a bit slow to start with it, but Shit's Creek has been. Really, yeah. really I haven't checked it out yet, so I gotta go. I gotta see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really good. And coincidentally, a few of the same actors and writers as, or um, well, not writers, but a few of the same people in Schitt's Creek are in Best in Show, mm. um, that movie that I was talking about. So, yeah, it's a, that's really good. Yeah, and then lots of RuPaul's Drag Race. And um, <laughs> I really need to watch mindless things at the end of the day, I think. It just helps me not think about work and just, again, reset and just be completely frivolous. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Can't, I can't, like on weekends, my partner's always wanting me to watch these really heavy movies and I'm like, no, I can't do it. I just have to watch something completely stupid. <laughs> I, I agree. When Sometimes when I'm, I'm traveling way back and I'm a voracious reader and or a like podcast listener, but sometimes, especially on the way back after a long day, <clears throat> I just need to go down that YouTube black hole. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> just look at the, yeah, stupid stuff. Just to yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. And finally, Will, how can people reach out or learn more about you? Okay. Um, yeah, our website, co-ap.com, or I've got, we're on Instagram as well, or I'm on Instagram, will.fung. It's my handle. <laughs> I don't post, I'm not very instant, so I post a lot of old stuff like old travels and things, dogs, architecture. So if you're into that type of thing, but maybe you get a bit of an insight into how I am through, through my posts, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had uh, one more question. Is there a story to how the name Co-App came along? Yeah, yeah, totally. When we <clears throat> started the practice, I want, really wanted it to call it Co-op. But of course, when you go to the Department of Fair Trading, you can't call your company co-op because it's not actually a co-op. Yeah. <laughs> so then it turned into co-op and then I was like, how can we justify co-op? So it's literally um, a acronym of collaborative architecture practice. And when we started, it was that, but it was just too much of a mouthful. So we just short, yeah, it was just co-op. Gotcha. So that's how we got co-op. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, where did that come from? So, yeah, just curious yeah. About <laughs> Will, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. It's really been fun having this casual conversation with you. I, I know I see you often on a week to week basis, but it's good to sit down and, and really yeah. have a chat about all things Will. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Dramatic response. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I will catch you around. Take yeah, care catch you around. Thank you so much. You too. Have a good weekend. All right. Well, thank you. See ya. Bye.
Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show. All the links to the show notes will be available at kevinleesocial.com, spelled K-E-V-I-N-L-Y. Conversely, if you have any interviews that you'd love to recommend, please send it over to kevinleesocial at gmail.com. I'd love to connect. Thank you. Until the next episode.